Hey, welcome back to Grace Walk Farm. Today, we want to invite you to come with us on a garden tour. Yeah, so we're going to go from the potato patch all the way around. We're going to show the full garden. You can hear our roosters in the <laughs> back. They're excited. It's been raining for the past two days, and so we finally have some sunshine. They're excited about life. We're excited about the garden. We want to show it off to you. Hope you'll stick around. All right, so we are in the middle of our potato patch, and here's kind of what we've got going on. These first two rows are Kennebec white potatoes, and the rest of the rows that you see are going to be Pontiac reds. We love red potatoes, we love white potatoes, but what we've actually done here, we, we put 150 pounds of seed potatoes in the ground out here, so we are going to have a ton of potatoes. So here's a few things uh, to keep in mind. These potatoes, they look fantastic. We've gotten uh, a good bit of rain over the past two days. So uh, that's been beneficial for them as well. But you'll notice they all are leafed out very, very well. These potatoes have been in the ground for about 15 days. Uh, when we planted them, they were already beginning to sprout. So uh, they, have, they have jumped to life really quick. What we did is we've we've got a we start off with a trench with each each potato uh, and then we we mounted them up and then you'll notice in between each hill this is a hill here's a hill uh, the aisleways uh, we have filled them full of mulch done that for a few reasons number one it looks better uh, but the primary reason is because this is going to help cut down on overgrowth of weeds naked soil will not stay naked for very long so uh, you know, right after you till your garden or you get it ready and you've planted it, it looks beautiful, but it will not stay that way long because uh, they, the weeds are going to overtake it. So what we've done is we've put uh, wood chips down in each aisle. Uh, and then after a rain like we've had for the past few days, what we like to do is come through here and make sure that the, 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 the dirt hasn't been pushed down too hard on top of these potatoes. Uh, you don't want your potatoes to be exposed to the sun because if they are, they will turn green and that's going to do a few things. It's going to make uh, your potatoes inedible. Um, a green potato is not a potato you want to eat and it's also not a potato that's going to produce for you. So you want to make sure that the dirt is mounded up around your potatoes. You don't want any of the potatoes exposed, only the leaves. So today we're going to spend just a little bit of time walking the aisles making sure that the potatoes are not exposed, uh, making sure that uh, there's no weeds overtaking anything. So follow along, let's take a look at them. So as you can see, our potatoes are doing really well. They're just about 15 days old, maybe 16 days, if I don't have my, my calendar correct, uh, but they're doing super. A uh, few things you wanna keep in mind with potatoes. Uh, again, you wanna make sure that they're mounded up well because your potatoes are gonna grow, grow down. Uh, especially with this variety here, this is a determinate potato. So I don't have to keep burying this. I don't need to keep putting dirt on top of the leaves and allow it, the plant to grow. Uh, these potatoes are going to grow down and they may even grow out just a little bit. Something to keep in mind with your potatoes. It's about a, oh, about a 10 to 12 week process, depending on what type of potatoes you have. These right here uh, say that they will be mature within about 100 to 110 days. So uh, it's a little bit of a process. Uh, you spend a lot of time getting them ready. You spend a lot of time taking care of them, but it's gonna take a while for them to produce. So you wanna do whatever it takes to make sure that uh, they're being watered well, that they get the light they need. And from time to time, it's not a bad idea to fertilize. Speaking of fertilizer, Josh was just talking about the potatoes, but fertilizer is important for the whole garden. And we're about to give you a tour of the raised bed garden, which is my favorite area. And in our raised bed garden, we use rabbit manure and compost. Those are our two fertilizers. And when you're using those organic materials, you really don't need synthetic fertilizer at all. So save your money on the miracle Grow and use something natural instead. So let's take a look at what's growing in these raised beds. We're up to 25 raised beds now. So I've got a lot to show you. Come on. This right here is my garlic bed and it is very weedy. It's the one bed that I've done a terrible job of weeding. You can see we've got some grass growing up in here, but our garlic is looking good. Um, you can see on the ends here, there's just a tiny bit 
of yellowing happening. That's because we've had a lot of rain and also because the garlic is getting close to harvest time. So we will harvest our garlic probably around mid-June. And once we see all of the stalks kind of die back and turn yellow, that's our sign that it's time to harvest the garlic. So we're just going to keep an eye on this for the next probably month or so, and then we'll have some fresh garlic. So this bed looks pretty empty right now, but it's actually just before bursting forth with new growth. So I have seeds all through this bed for summer squash. And then here on the ends, we've got some winter squash. So right here, we've got two little spaghetti squash plants. And that over there is a cream of the crop acorn squash. And the reason I put those in the corners is because both of those like to vine. And so we're gonna let those vine off to the back here in the garden where it won't infringe on where we're walking. Nobody will trip or step on the vines. So my vining squash kind of goes to the side of the garden. And then here on the trellis, we've got some things planted as well. On each arch through the garden, we've got different things planted. On this particular trellis, we have planted some green beans. So we're excited for lots of green beans. It's one of our favorite parts of the summer, and this arch will soon be full of them. Let's talk about this other garden bed here in the front, right here beside me. This bed has a ton of stuff going on, but I'm gonna give you a sneak peek into what's happening. So here on this side, we have radishes. I've got cherry bell and French breakfast radishes, and these are actually ready. We've been harvesting these and eating on them, but I'll show you one. It's a small one. Look at that. It's a little cherry bell radish. So radishes are one of the fastest growing crops. They only take around three to four weeks to develop from the time you put a seed in the ground till the time you can harvest your radishes. And you can use these in lots of ways. A lot of times people think a radish is best for salad, but you can also use radishes um, like potatoes and you can roast them and it gives it a little bit of a more mellow flavor, not quite so spicy. So for kids especially, roasting is a really good way to use up lots of radishes and get more vitamins than your kids. So this whole patch here is radishes. And then if we walk down a little ways over on this side, We've got some Merlot lettuce, this beautiful kind of wine-colored lettuce right here. And then we've got spinach that's coming up around. And then this right here is calendula. And the radishes are almost taking it over, but we have a whole row of calendula. And right here is our upcoming tromboncino squash plant. So I'm really excited about that. That will climb this trellis and eventually it will produce squash that are six to seven feet long even. I mean, they can grow and grow and grow. So that tiny little plant is gonna produce a ton of food for our family this year. And that's what's happening in this bed. All right, let's take a look back here behind us. <clears throat> this bed behind me is planted with a few things that still are coming up as well. We've got some dill for pickle making. We've got a couple of other squash plants in here. And then we've got sunflowers planted here on the end. Um, and these sunflowers are blue or white light sunflowers. So they're going to be white sunflowers, which I'm excited to try. And then we have some peppers here. These are, um, let's see here. We have a Cherokee bell pepper and an Ozark giant bell pepper. Six little plants. We've also got some herbs tucked in here. And again, there are seeds everywhere. You see blank spaces. It's already planted. We're just waiting on the crop to come up. So it won't be long and this will all be filled in and it will be an absolute jungle. But today you get to see the start of it. Let's move to the next bed. Let's go across the way. This bed is more peppers. We've got lots of hot peppers in this bed. I've got habaneros, Carolina reapers, I looked for really hot peppers for this bed because this will be our hot sauce bed. And I'll use all these peppers to make hot sauce for my guys who like things really spicy. This bed is looking really good, guys. This is where I've got the zucchini planted. And you'll see it, there's quite a few zucchini plants in here. They get rather big. But my plan with this zucchini is to actually prune it heavily and stake it up so that we can 
uh, kind of accommodate more plants in one space. And staking can really help you prevent a lot of the powdery mildew and the uh, mold and fungus and issues that tend to affect zucchini and squash. You can grow those vertically with staking and avoid a lot of that. So that's my plan here. We're going to try vertical growing with our zucchini this year. We'll do the same thing with some of the squash you see that's coming up. But for right now, we're just letting it spread and grow and do its own happy little thing. Here on the end, we've got sunflowers. You'll notice that's kind of a pattern. All the beds here next to the greenhouse, we've put sunflowers on the ends. Um, and it will create like a beautiful walkway where you'll walk by the sunflowers when you come down the aisle. So I think it'll turn out really pretty. And then every bed also attaches to a trellis. So here you can see the trellises that we've installed. These are um, bent into arches. These are made from 16 foot cattle panels that we get at a uh, tractor supply. And we have secured them to wooden stakes with a zip tie, um, with a couple of zip ties actually. And we bent it to make this arch so you can literally walk through the arch in your garden. And it creates this nice little happy pathway. Um, plus it's very functional because we can cover this in vining plants and we can increase the amount of food we can grow in our garden space by growing vertically. So I'll just go ahead and kind of list some of the things. The trellises are empty currently because the seeds have just gone in, but some of the things we're gonna be growing are the Tromboncino squash, Malabar spinach, which is a heat-loving summer spinach um, that can quickly vine and cover a whole trellis. Um, we're also going to do some green beans and some long beans and of course lots of cucumbers. We love cucumbers around here. So we'll be filling all of these arches up with lots of good stuff. So let's take a look at this bed right here. You'll notice I have a tomato plant right here and this is a Chadwick cherry tomato. And I'm actually going to um, let this thing grow just a little more and then we'll tie it to the trellis here. And my hope is to train the cherry tomato plant to climb this arch. And I've also got one planted on the other side and I'm hoping it will cover the entire arch. I've tried this with a regular tomato plant, but I've never tried it with cherry tomatoes. But I'm hopeful Chadwick cherries get really long and prolific. If you are looking for a good cherry tomato variety to try, Chadwick cherry is the way to go. Sun golds are good too, but really nothing beats a Chadwick cherry in my book. They are sweet and juicy and they're big. I mean, they get to about that big. So you definitely give Chadwick cherries a try. So we've also got some squash in this bed. And then this is a Japanese green. It's called Old Tokyo and it's filling in nicely. And then of course, sunflowers on the end, like all the other beds. Now let's take a look in this bed there's a lot more happening over here so this bed is full of greens so we've got sunflowers on the end and then on the far side that is purple vienna kohlrabi which is a brassica it's a cabbage like plant then we have um, some lacinato kale we also know that is dino kale or dinosaur kale it's a very tender kale if you tend to shy away from kale because you don't like the texture, you might actually like dinosaur kale better or lost in auto kale. It's a real tender, sweet kind of green. Then we also have uh, some Blue Ridge kale, which is a more traditional. And then look at this oak leaf lettuce. Come in here close and look at this. Look how beautiful. We've had lots of rain, so it's wet, but this is a new kind of lettuce to us this year. The first time we're trying it. It's called oak leaf, which makes sense when you look closely at this leaf. It looks like an oak leaf off a tree. And it kind of has a similar taste and texture to like a butter crunch lettuce. Um, it's very sweet and mild. So if you're looking for a new lettuce to try, try this oak leaf. It's doing well here in our unpredictable Carolina temperatures where we have nights that are cold and days that can get up to 85. You just never know. So it's doing well. So this bed is full of greens, lots of good salads that will be coming out of this bed soon. Here is our companion planting experiment of the year. I'm trying something completely new here and I really have high hopes for it. So here beside me, you can see I've got a couple of Vego beds, V-E-G-O. These are metal garden beds that we have um, used for about a year and we love them. But I have planted broccoli down the middle of these beds and then around the edge, I've added onions. 
And then if you look over on this bed, I've kind of done something similar. We have strawberries planted all through this bed and they are surrounded again by onions. So why are we putting onions everywhere? Well, for one thing, we use a lot of onions here on the farm for cooking and for canning and preserving. So it's a crop that I know we'll use a lot of. Um, but it also is a really good companion plant. So growing onions and strawberries together can actually deter a lot of the common pests that attack your strawberry plants. So in theory, it could protect your harvest if you're growing your strawberries and onions together. Same thing with the broccoli and onions. So you'll notice in my garden, I have lots of different plants paired together in different combinations. Almost every bed has at least one or two herbs in it. It's because companion planting is really kind of like the cheat sheet for organic gardening. If you don't want to use pesticides and sprays, you're really going to need to, to harness the power of uh, other plants and nature and the compounds that naturally exist in the garden and how you pair things together. And by doing that, you'll have a natural pest control um, that really works. This is our third year of organic gardening and each year I do more and more companion planting because I've seen firsthand how really powerful it can be. So here's our little companion planting beds. Let's head back over to the other part of the garden. I've still got more raised beds to show you. All right, in this bed, I've got several different things going on, but they're mostly brassicas. Now, brassica is a family of plant. It includes things like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower and some of those cool weather plants. Now, spring here in North Carolina is a little bit tricky when it comes to brassicas because it tends to warm up really, really quickly. We can go from freezing nights to 85 degree days just like that. And a lot of times our plants like cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, they struggle because they tend to bolt or flower when it gets hot. So we have our best success growing this particular family of plants in the fall, but that doesn't mean I'm not gonna give it at least a good fighting chance for spring because we do really want some homegrown broccoli and Brussels sprouts. So here in this bed, you'll see we've got both Romanesco broccoli plants and then Brussels sprouts. And the Brussels sprouts especially are looking so good, you guys. I have high hopes for these that we might get a good harvest if the temperatures stay cool enough for long enough. I've also got a beautiful purple kale plant here and of course some rosemary in both corners. And again, rosemary is a companion plant to help repel pests. And if you look at this cabbage, this cabbage hasn't been sprayed with anything and there's not a single bug on it, no damage. That is because it's surrounded with rosemary, and rosemary and kale make really good friends in the garden. So in this bed to my left, we have some experiments happening this year. I'm growing peanuts for the first time. Never tried this before. I have no idea how well it will do here in my climate, but we're giving it a go. So I've planted peanuts, and they're just starting to come up. And then I've also planted loofah to grow up this beautiful art and cover it up. And then on this side, you'll see we've got some snap peas that are coming in. Um, and then this bed is full of carrots because peas and carrots make good companions. There we go again with companion planting, but they go really well together. So I'm growing peas and carrots in this bed, peanuts and loofah in that bed. And hopefully the loofah will cover this arch here in the next few months. All right, so this little bed is our strawberry bed. Um, we've actually multiplied this bed already this year. You've already seen one uh, that's got onions growing in it. This is where it all began. This bed started out with six strawberry plants about three years ago. So this gives you an idea of how quickly they can spread and they reproduce. You'll, if you know anything about strawberries, you know that they like to put off runners. Strawberries are going to start with a crown, um, which is main channel of the root and they will multiply quickly as you can see and this particular strawberry is an ever berry uh, ever bearing strawberry plant which means it's going to produce really most of the year probably eight out of 12 months it's going to produce strawberries and you'll notice that it's already full of blooms it's ready to go it's bright green the leaves look great there's very little if any damage but I also wanted to show you something else right beside the bed a few, a few minutes ago, we were in the potato patch and we were talking about the benefits of, of using mulch and wood chips in your walk path. 
I want you to notice right here, this is the one area in our garden that I have not put a whole lot of attention into. Everything else has been covered with new mulch. Everything else has been weeded except this. This is the same mulch from last year. And as you can see, it's overgrown. Now, a lot of this are strawberry plants that have run from this bed into the aisle. In fact, it was like this all the way around. So strawberries are going to multiply, but mulch is also going to help cut down on the weeds. If you look through here, you can see this loaded with weeds. So I can't emphasize and stress enough, if you have the, op if you have the option, uh, make sure that you're putting mulch in your walk paths, in your garden, it will save you hours of backbreaking work pulling weeds. Here is a cabbage bed. We have lots of different cabbages in this bed. And this is a prime example of what I was talking about, about how our springs here in North Carolina warm up so quickly. You'll see here this cabbage plant is starting to bolt. So when I say bolt, it just means it's going to flower. That happens when it gets too hot. So you can come in here and pinch the flowers off to try to prolong the life of your cabbage. Um, but once they start to bolt, there's really not a whole lot you can do to save them. So you can still eat the leaves. You can see these are starting to look a little bug damaged over here. This is the only bed that I don't have companion planted herbs in. And there's the difference. Massive bug damage because there's no herbs to hold it back. So we need to come in here and add some herbs to this bed and just continually check for bolted for bolted plants. Now the flowers, when your brassicas bolt or your cabbage, you can eat these. They actually taste just like broccoli. Um, so you can throw them in your salad. You definitely don't have to waste it. Um, they're actually quite delicious, really. <laughs> Tastes like broccoli. All right, let's talk about this section of the raised bed garden. So here to my left, we have the herb bed and it's a little wild and crazy. I'm in the middle of separating out some of these herbs to move around. We have bee balm, we have lemon balm, we have lavender and oregano, we have pineapple sage, a ton of different plants in this bed, but they're all herbs um, that we will grow to dry for medicinal teas and such. On this side, we have kind of a variety of things planted. This trellis will eventually be covered in cucumbers. But for now, we have um, sugar snap peas growing along the trellis. We also have beets and collard greens and arugula all kind of scattered around in this bed. And then here beside me, this is one of our cooler beds because we actually attach the arch to the sides of the bed. And what happens is as it fills in, it almost creates a shaded tunnel. So I have planted some more cabbage plants here in the middle because they like the shade a little bit, especially in the hot temperatures. So as the cabbage grows along the side, we're gonna be growing cucumbers, pickling cucumbers. So once this fills in, it will provide shade and I can keep growing things like lettuces and spinach and you know uh, kale stuff like that all through the summer long with the help of the shade which is going to come from my cucumber vines so that's another little vertical growing trick come on and let's show you uh, some more potatoes all right so this bed is another potato bed this was an original bed that we built uh, a little over three years ago this when we first started gardening here on our homestead uh, this was one of the first like five beds that we made. So it's an original uh, and we're growing more potatoes here. We started out here and then we had a change of plans and it's pretty funny. My mom and dad garden as well and they have a lot more land to, to grow on than we do. And so dad's actually got a huge plot of corn this year. And so we decided that since he was growing the corn, we would grow the potatoes. So after we already had this bed planted, we decided to plant the big bed that you saw uh, at the beginning of this video. So again, we've got over 150 pounds of seed potatoes in the ground. And if they do what they're supposed to do, we could end up with over 3,000 pounds of potatoes, which would be fine with us. So this bed is full of Kennebec white potatoes. And you'll notice that some of the plants look a little bigger than the ones that you saw at the beginning. For instance, this one here, there's one right down there. We did not plant these. These are volunteers. We grew potatoes in this bed last year. Didn't have the best year, um, but evidently we missed a few. 
because these came up on their own. These will be ready, we're hoping, um, around the second or third week of June. Um, at least that's what we've got in our mind anyway. So right now everything's looking really well. We've got a few plants that are kind of small still. There's one right here that if you, if you focused in, you'll see it's pretty small. Uh, but everyone else is doing really, really well. None of our potatoes are exposed. We don't have bug damage. Now, one of the things that we like to do, and we have done in the past, is to companion plant with potatoes. And one of the best things that you can plant with potatoes uh, are beans, green beans. You could do a bush bean or a pole bean, depending on what your preference is. And the reasoning behind that is not so much related to bugs as it is to chemicals. Uh, those beans, as they grow, they are putting nitrogen back into the soil, and potatoes love nitrogen. So if you're getting ready to start planting potatoes, or if you already have and you wanted to add something with it, think about adding beans because it will do wonders for your soil. Welcome to my favorite part of the whole garden, the tomato garden. So we are growing tomatoes in a no-dig style garden, and let me just show you what we got going on. We got three big rows of tomatoes here. On my left, we have a row of beefsteak tomatoes. On my right, we have a row of just assorted different big slicer tomatoes. We have homestead tomatoes. We have pineapple tomatoes. We have gold medal tomatoes. We have Cherokee purple tomatoes and black beauty tomatoes. If you can't tell, we like tomatoes. So we kind of spread them out. And in between our tomato plants, you'll notice we've also put in some basil and there's some marigolds that are still almost too small to see. But we're creating a kind of companion planted environment here where our tomatoes will thrive with basil to repel the bugs and marigolds to trap pests like hornworms. Um, this is a companion planting situation that has worked well for us in the past and we're excited to try it again. And then we've got a third row of tomatoes over here on this side. Let's go check it out. So here on this row, we've added a whole side full of paste tomatoes. These are the tomatoes that we will use for canning for things like tomato sauce, for ketchup and salsa and enchilada sauce and tomato soup and all the things that we'll use with our homegrown tomatoes. So as you look at how these are planted, you may notice we've got some string here and there's a reason for that. So we start our trellises fairly high up because these tomato plants will get quite tall by the end of the growing season. But until they reach to the top of the trellis, we're using twine just to hold the plant up and in place and keep it from falling over in the wind. And this method works really well. And then as the plants grow, we'll just come in here and tighten this up to give them a little more a little more strength as they work their way towards being at the trellis. And once they reach this, we'll use twine or zip ties to attach the plant to the trellis itself and we'll heavily prune it. More on that soon. We're gonna do a workshop on tomato pruning next month. Um, but it won't be long and we'll have fresh tomatoes. And I'm seriously more excited for this than anything else in the garden. Who doesn't love good tomatoes? <laughs> And the last part of our garden tour for this month, we're gonna end on the green bean wall. That's at least that's what we call it. Uh, again, we are big fans of the 16 foot cattle panel. That's what this is all the way down. Uh, I believe this is three cattle panels um, that we've set up. And what we are growing here are just regular half runner green beans. You'll notice they're already starting to come up. I'm probably going to have to go back through and plant a few more. Our seeds are a little bit old uh, and we haven't quite got the germination rate that we were hoping for, but that's okay. We're still very early in the season. So early, in fact, that we can probably do three rounds of green beans before we run out of temperature that will allow us to do so. So no worries there. They're just getting started. Green beans are something that uh, it takes a little bit of time for them to get going, but once they do, they will really take off. One thing that you'll notice if you look closely here is our green bean area has a few weeds. Right there's one. So here's a tip for you. Never, ever, ever walk in your garden without picking at least one weed. Never. Why would you? 
if you allow the weeds to take over, it will take hours upon hours. And a lot of times it'll get so bad that you'll just throw your hands up in disgust. But when you start with a clean slate, especially at the beginning of the season, and you see a few, uh, a few weeds that are growing through, just take just a moment, come through, pick them out. You want to try to get the weed, uh, the, uh, the root of the weed, but just don't walk through without getting at least one. Here is our final bed, and this is one of the Vigo beds, the metal bed, and it's extra long, and we have filled this bed up with goodies for the pollinators, for our bees and our butterflies. You'll see lots of flowers in this bed. We have some celosia and some petunias and some pansies. We've also got some Thai basil, um, a small prism pepper plant, and then herbs, we've got clary sage, we have some whorehound and motherwort and St. John's wort, um, lots of medicinals here real close to my kitchen so I can run out and grab them as I need them. Um, one of our goals for this year is to try, try to go a little deeper into herbalism and harvest enough herbs to make our own tinctures. So this is where that will begin. So that's our final garden bed. And I hope you enjoyed this tour of our garden you know, spring has officially arrived. We're spending a lot of time now out here on the farm, and we're excited to see where this year's harvest season takes us. Follow along, stick around, because it won't be long, and we're gonna be teaching you how to can all this good produce together.